Revelation chapter 9. Ahem. If you guys knew what I was going to preach this morning, that's right, you would be. I had one of those deals to where I didn't, uh, I didn't know what to preach, and um, so I was praying, and God said, uh, "What's?" What's, what's on your heart? What's on your heart? And uh, I told him, and he said, preach that. And I went, oh, that makes sense. And uh, I'll explain it a little bit more as we go along this morning. Revelation chapter 9. Are you here? Say amen. Got your Bible open? Say amen. Revelation 9. <clears throat> We've got these locusts. Coming out of the bottomless pit, the bottomless pit is uh, referenced several times in the Bible, a uh, few times in the book of Revelation, by the, name, by the specific name bottomless pit. Uh, the word pit itself in typology, whenever you see uh, somebody cast into a pit, um, in fact, I'll, I'll just throw it out to you. Nick, give me a story in the Bible where somebody was thrown into a pit. Okay, Joseph, that's an easy one. So what is this, you know, the, let's, let's learn typology a little bit and how it works. What's the symbolism of that? If, jo if, if Joseph, uh, a man will represent uh, either Christ or Antichrist, one of the two. A woman will represent a church of some kind, either uh, a wise church, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, uh, the virtuous woman mentioned in Proverbs 31, um, or the strange woman church, where she has strange doctrines and all of her doctrines lead everybody to hell. So you have those two things there. So Joseph would be a type of Christ or Antichrist, which one? Christ, okay, because he saves his, his brethren. They cast him into a pit. If the pit represents, let's say the pit here, when it's opened up, we've got fire and smoke belching out of it. So that would indicate hell. So the pit that Joseph was thrown into was a pit wherein there was no water. What did the rich man, when he was in the pit, when he was in hell, what did he want more than anything? Water. So Joseph, a type of Christ, cast into a pit, but he comes out and he ends up being the savior, basically, of the known world back then because of his position in Egypt. So that's how you read that. Uh, later on, Joseph, the same Joseph, was cast into prison. What did he do wrong? Nothing. What did Christ do wrong? Nothing. And yet, what did Joseph do when he was in prison? What is the Bible? I mean, we don't know how long he was in prison. Could have been months, could have been maybe a couple years, we don't know, but... Um, Forever how long he was there, the Bible doesn't record every incident that happened to Joseph while he was in prison, but it only re it records one. And what was that? Interpret the dreams. So he's prophesying, correct? Okay. So what does the Bible, what did Peter say that Jesus did to the spirits in prison? He preached to them. Okay. And... Some of the spirits are bad, some are good. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man goes to the lower part of the earth, hell. But so does Lazarus. But Lazarus is in a place that's not on fire. It's a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. So both of them are down there. And what happens to Lazarus and all the people that are in Abraham's bosom? What happened to the man, the thief on the cross? 
When he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day you should be with me in paradise. So the Bible says that Jesus came to set captivity free. So that's what happened to all the people in Abraham's bosom is that they're set free. So we go back now to Joseph preaching in prison. And we have the baker and the butler. And the butler offended Pharaoh, was cast into prison. But what happened to the butler? Joseph prophesied to him his dream that he's standing over Pharaoh and squeezing grapes into Pharaoh's cup again. And Joseph said, you're going to be lifted up and you're going to be restored. Hallelujah. And the, the baker said, oh, I had a dream too. And he said, I've got bread on my head. Never carried it that way. But he said, then the birds came and ate all the bread out of it. What does that mean? And Joseph said, you're going to be lifted up too. But then you're going to be hung on a tree. What, what, cursed is he who hangeth from a tree. So when Jesus preaches to those who are in the lower parts of the earth, one group, he's preaching to them and saying, you didn't believe in me. You didn't trust in me. You didn't call upon the name of the Lord. So you're going to remain here for a little while and then you're going to be taken out. You're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But to those who were in Abraham's bosom, he preaches salvation and they are lifted up literally and taken up into the paradise of God. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. I don't know why I brought... Anyway, that's the pit that is opened up here, I believe, in Revelation 9, sounding of the fifth trumpet. So we have a description now. You've learned a little bit about typology, which is one of my favorite subjects. We have the description of these locusts. Um, let's read all the way from 7 to verse 11. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like unto gold or like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And that hair is the hair of women. And this is where we're at now. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And we're going to talk about that. And notice in verse 9, they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. Iron represents things that are hard, things that are immovable, that are not malleable like clay is. Iron doesn't bend. It doesn't um, think of someone who, when we say someone has an iron will, what do we mean by that? It means that you're not going to change their mind easily. They don't just bend to get out of everybody's way. Okay? Everybody has to get out of their way because they're iron. They don't change and they don't compromise. Okay? So just kind of think about that and what it means. We have a kingdom of iron in Daniel chapter 2 that make up part of the toes of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And the iron then is mingled with clay. Clay is not iron. Because what can you do with clay that you can't do with iron? You can make snakes. Right? That's why there's so many of them. God's like, these are easy. That's, a, that's an old joke. Um, so the clay represents humans. So you have malleable movable, bendable humans who go after change all the time, be not conformed. Conformed has the word con meaning with and formed meaning taking the shape of. And you have people that are always following the trends of this world, aren't they? If the Hollywood people dress this way or the music people dress a certain way, then these people are going to dress this way and they're going to fix their hair that way. Who, who in here besides Elvis Presley had big, long, mutton chop sideburns back in the day? Uh -huh. Yeah, our dad. And my dad liked Elvis. So we had on, he was kind of looking at that going, oh, that looks nice. He had them big, long sideburns. 
And what happens is people, every new thing that comes out, they, they conform to that. So what's happening now with this world, with this country, where the same people 60 years ago would have never allowed an openly homosexual or sodomite man or woman be a teacher in a school, a principal in a school, a bus driver in a school, would have never allowed that. Now, it's almost like you have to hire some of them just so you don't get in trouble. And these, even people who were against it in days gone by, they have conformed to the world over the course of these last 60 years. And now they're accepting it. So, I, you know, I brought up, I'm not going to do it again this morning, but I brought up the denomination last week, how they are conforming now to the shape and the form of this world. We're not supposed to do that, meaning you're not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? So that's the, that's the iron part of it. Um, let me move down uh, and keep reading here. Verse... Let's see here. Verse 9. Breastplates of iron. They had the sound of their wings. as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. What happened in Las Vegas last week? Big, big, huge thing. Made a lot of news outlets. Las Vegas. Apparently you didn't see it. Yes! The what? A 911 call saying that a UFO crashed in their backyard and they could see these creatures, eight, nine, ten feet tall. And he said they, hate, they look like aliens, have big eyes, big mouths. And the guy said, I'm, I'm scared to death. At that same time, a police officer just down the road was talking to somebody and their body camera captured an image of this light falling from the sky at that same time uh, I can't remember where the sound came from but there's a recording from a video that was being videoed at that same time and you hear a crash and it's in the same vicinity and the the guy that called 911 said that when they looked toward where this thing crashed in their backyard, all they could see was like a haze. You know how like the news will haze something out on a video so you can't see somebody's face or, you know, wounds or whatever? He said that's what they saw. They couldn't see past that. But they, they know that there is a big giant circle in the grass in their backyard. They're also saying that they have a video of it. Beasts like iron. Beasts are like iron, aren't they? Can you change the will and the nature of a beast? Can you make a horse? Can a here we go with the LGBTQ. Can a horse decide one day he wants to be a goldfish? Okay. So anyway, I'll probably talk about chariots next Sunday morning. Anyway, let's look at these. Uh, let me finish this. And they had, uh, verse 10, they had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Again, that means destroyer. Let's look at these lion's teeth for a minute. What is the symbolism of that? Uh, let's see if I have the book of Joel here. No, let's go back to the book of Joel very quickly. Chapter 1. And you'll see this is uh, a description of the army that is referred to as Joel's army. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. If you find those, you'll find Joel. And so in Joel chapter 1, verse 5, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine. For it is cut off from your mouth, new wine, picture of the, 
The Word of God, it's unfermented. It does not have corruption in it. Leaven is always a type of sin. A little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. Leaven is a picture of false doctrine. Jesus warned about the leaven of the Pharisees. So they have leavened wine, but they don't have new wine. It's been cut off, been taken away from them, which then will cause a church or will cause a, an individual person who at one time said they believed the Bible, it will cause them to no longer believe certain parts of the Bible or the Bible as a whole. They won't believe it anymore. It's been cut off from them. It's a judgment from God because of their sin. And he says in verse 6, for a nation, he calls this a nation. It is a unique type of people that God has. And there are physical nations in the physical realm that you and I live in. And there are spiritual nations. That's what we're called, a spiritual nation. This is a spiritual nation. This is, this is a nation of devils, a league of devils. A nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. That's another indication of the fact that they are spirits, they're without number. Whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. I used to watch a lot of videos, um, followed this channel on YouTube, uh, Rob the Ranger. And uh, he always liked to catch lions, chasing the prey, uh, lurking after the prey, hiding to where you couldn't see them because the color of their fur matched perfectly the, the, uh, the grass that they hid in. Uh, you would never know they were coming until they were right on top of you. And then with their teeth, the lions would sit there and chew into that tough hide of whatever it was, if it was a gazelle or wildebeest or whatever it was, they would chew and grind through that tough hide of that, of that animal and poke their way through until they got to the meat. So these teeth, they're bad, bad things. They're there to destroy, okay? Psalm 57, 4, my soul. Think about now what I just said, this being a spiritual nation. My soul is among lions. His soul is. His physical presence. I mean, I don't have lions around me, but I've had lions after me. My, I've had times when my soul was among lions. I didn't like it. A lot of fear. Fear of being destroyed. Fear of being devoured. My soul is among lions. And I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men. I know we've covered this, but kind of backing up a little bit. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. That's what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs about the strange woman. Is that her tongue and her mouth is like a sharp two-edged sword. Well, thank God we have something that is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen? Sharper than her words. Better than her words, I'd say. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies, um, we were when my aunt came up from Georgia and my uncle and his wife, my aunt came up from Little Rock and mom, we were all together and we were talking about my mom's brother, Sonny. He died at what, 35, 34 years old, died of cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, he drank. And drank and drank and drank and drank and drank like Gary's doing now. It's just water. But he drank and drank and drank and drank until he literally destroyed his liver. Died at 34 years old. That's just one year over Christ's death. Wasted his life. Destroyed himself. And he was rotten from how old? Young as you can remember, right? How, let's see. I remember the story. My grandma ran a little grocery store. And he, climbed, he got up on the shelf where she kept x lax He thought it was chocolate. Ate the whole box. Had put him in a, it probably would have been better for him to have died then. Put him in the hospital, almost killed him. But that's, 
it's like from that point forward, he was rotten to the core. Bad, bad man, evil man. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. And there's usually one in every family that almost as soon as they get to early childhood, you can tell they're messed up. They're poison. They speak lies, by the way. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Some of these wicked people estranged from the womb are preachers or priests or popes or religious leaders of some kind. They have an influence over man's soul. And because of their evilness, they're not born again. Therefore, they will not adhere to the Word of God, nor will they follow the Holy Spirit and be led by the Holy Spirit. So when they speak, the words that come out of their mouth are poison, just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He didn't bite Eve. He spoke to her. And it poisoned her here. And the poison that preachers now are pouring out and priests and bishops and popes and all kinds of religious leaders all around the world. They're just pouring out, spewing out venom. Uh, just recently, this church in Kenya, Mombasa, which is uh, by the uh, Indian Ocean. It's a big tourist area. This wicked preacher had a large congregational following, a cult, and he convinced... People. He's been doing it apparently for years because they're still finding bodies. He convinces people that the only way that they can be accepted by God is for them to literally fast and pray until they die. And then God will accept them. And all of a sudden now people are dying. They're being buried in shallow graves. Now they're, it, the truth is coming out. They found over 200 bodies already out in the forest of people that he lied to and they believed it because they got their mind poisoned and by the way they're also deaf like the, they're like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear which means that they will not listen to the word of god therefore they will not have faith in god which will not hearken to the voice of charmers charming never so wisely break their teeth O god in their mouth break out the great teeth of the young lions O lord so as you're reading the Bible, and I, and I struggled with this for a while, even, you know, when I really, really started taking Bible study seriously, I'd look at lines, I'd say, God, what, what does that mean? What, we, don't, we don't have any, I mean, we've got, I guess what you could call lions in Missouri. We've got bobcats, okay? Uh, I'm not too worried about them. But anyway... Then it occurred to me, he's talking about the spirits in the spiritual realm. Lions surrounding us, lions going on the tack after us. And, God, and he's begging God to break out the great teeth of the young lions so that they do not have an effect upon God's people. In 1 Samuel chapter, oh, I like this story. 1 Samuel 17, you might want to turn there. This is the story of David and Goliath. It's one of the first stories we learn in Sunday school. And I like that. We teach children at an early age that they can believe in giants. Do you believe in giants? You believe in dragons? Believe in unicorns? You should. They're all meant, all three of them are meant, and I go around as a joke if I preach at a conference and they've never heard me before, I say, I love God's people because you're the only people in the whole world who actually do believe in giants, dragons, and unicorns. And some people laugh like Chris did, they get it, and other people are going, no I don't. <laughs> oh well. So this is the story of Goliath, and notice how David described Goliath. David, remember what typology is. So we have David and Goliath. Who's David? Christ or Antichrist? Christ. Who's Goliath? See how easy that is? And David is a... What's his occupation? 
The Lord is my shepherd. Okay. So uh, Goliath, you're gonna you, if you look at his description, he's got sixes all over him, six cubits tall, spearhead um, weighs. Yeah, giants have six fingers, six toes. Uh, Goliath's spear head weighs. Uh, let's see, and the target of brass, when it's, it's the staff of his spear, verse 7, is like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. There's iron again. Okay, 600 is part of 600, 3 scored in 6. So he's got sixes all over him. And then, in verse 34, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear. And took a lamb out of the flock. Now, think of, now, this is Christ now. And you're the lamb. You're the lamb. And the devil came and stole you out of God's flock. David said, I went after him. I would have ran away and told dad, dad, we just lost a sheep. David said, I ran after him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. David beat that lion up. Grabbed him. The last place I want to grab a lion is near his mouth. But David is full of the Holy Ghost. And, and he, he didn't know it at the time. God was setting him up to be a warrior. David smote that lion, beat him up. So think about it. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. What does it say? Walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he said, verse 36... Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And uh, the exact description of the beast in Revelation 13 is that he's a lion and a bear. Exactly. So the Bible's telling you, this is how this is going to end. Do you trust God and do you trust His Word? When you see David destroying Goliath, who is obviously... Larger than him, stronger than him, more experienced as a warrior than David is. David is small, he's young, he's tender. He's, he's, the Bible said he's ruddy, which means he's red-headed, freckle-faced. He's Opie Taylor. They would be like Opie Taylor from Andy Griffith's show beating up a giant. But he did. Once he hit him in the head, and he fell, by the way, the beast has a deadly wound in his head. And he fell on his face before David. And David took his sword and cut his head off. Amen. Listen, Jesus is going to win the battle. Trust him. Trust him. And I used to get, I used to preach this in a way that sort of, um, it sort of mocked all of the army of Israel who sat on the sidelines and nobody ever got up to do anything to try to kill Goliath. And I used to use that and say, you know, you're, you're like those army guys there sitting there doing nothing while Goliath is there on, on land that doesn't belong to him. He's in Judah and he's, he's a trespasser and he's going to use the, uh, his height and his, everything like that. And the army of the Philistines, they're just going to take over and you're just going to stand there and let him. But I don't look at it that way anymore. I look at it like there was only one person in the entire world that God raised up to defeat Goliath. And his name was David. And there's only one person in all of God's creation that God has raised up to defeat the things that you cannot defeat. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? So I like the story better now. Because I would have been one of the soldiers going, listen, I, I'd like to fight and die for Israel, but I'd just be walking out there and just dying. That's all. I, I'd be cannon fodder. That's all I'd be. Fish in a barrel. Okay? It would be worthless for me to walk out there. But not David. 
David is the man that God raised up. Okay? Yes, sir. Exactly. He had Saul. He, Saul is offering his armor, and Saul says, "Put this on." And David said, "Well, number one, it won't fit." <laughs> but he said, "I've not. I've not tested this. I've not tried it. So I'm, I don't trust it. I'm going to put my life into the hands of this armor, and I don't know that it'll actually protect me. But I know God will. So I'll let Him be my shield, and I'll let Him be." my breastplate of righteousness, and I'll let him do all of those things for me, the armor of God. But let me finish with this. David. There's a list in the Bible of what's called David's mighty men. These were men that fought side by side with David. And it's like they were almost, they were almost unkillable. Almost superhuman in the power that they had. You have one man killing thousands of Philistines. Of David's mighty men. If you don't believe the Bible, then that story doesn't make sense to you. But I believe that God can empower one man to kill thousands of the enemy. Is what I believe. Okay? And we have Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. The son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. And this is where I get into the paranormal part. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. Now what does that mean? Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit. In a snowy day. It seems like Benaiah's specialty is killing lions. But what does it mean, two lion-like men? Because we have the, the, the carving that you see uh, there on your right is, does anybody know who that is? It's the god Mithras. And if you've read The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf's name, Gandalf the Wizard, one of his names is Mithrandir. Remember that? I read The Lord of the Rings when I was in high school, and I didn't know that J.R. Tolkien pulled stuff out of mythology. So he named Gandalf the wizard after Mithras. Mithras had a human form. He is, you see him coiled with a serpent that shows his nature and what he's, who he really is. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, his great authority. He has the face of a lion. So who is Mithras now? Mithras is a type of the Antichrist. Because that's what Revelation 13 says. Also, throughout history, people have seen entities, spirits, people in people that have chant people that are into channeling, which means that they get in contact with familiar spirits, people who are into the UFO stuff who think they can speak right to the aliens, and in some cases, those aliens appeared to them as a human body, in a human form, but the face of a lion. And is that far-fetched? No, not at all. When you read Ezekiel 1, you have the cherubs that they have four faces. One is the face of an ox, face of an eagle, the face of a man. What's the fourth one? Face of a lion. Human body, face of a lion okay so we're talking about real things here not fantasy not make-believe not anything like that we're talking about real things and these devils they are deceivers they are the gods who are attempting as we speak to take over this world and we stand against them and we wouldn't be able to if God didn't enable us. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Father, bless your word. We thank you for it. Open our eyes to wondrous things out of thy law, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people, say it. Amen. amen.